Okay. Good morning, everyone. This is the CNPS Science Chat. Today is January 12th, 2019. And today we have our special speaker, Jeff Yi, and he will be speaking on the simplicity of subatomic particles. So go ahead, Jeff. Bring me. I am clicking once again back through to the title slide and just want to confirm that you can see it. Yes, we can see it. Come up. Great. So the way that I have arranged uh, today's presentation is about it's about 30 minutes in length, and I think it should give uh, ample time for for questions. But if you do have any questions along the way um, while I'm presenting, uh, go ahead and and ask. Or, or Franklin, you might have to flag me since I'm not looking at Fuse at the same time. I've switched slides, so hopefully everything is, is working for you. You should see a slide titled The Simplicity of Molecules and Atoms. Yeah, so my talk is on the sim yeah, my talk is on the simplicity of subatomic uh, particles. But before I get into the work that I've done, I just want to spend a few minutes reviewing what I think most people here already know, but you'll see why uh, I review this particular topic uh, as I get into my work in a few minutes. So let, let's just quickly review history. Right. What mankind once thought was complex was eventually simplified in terms of molecules and atoms. And by that, I mean early Greeks, you know, centuries and centuries ago, thought there were four elements, earth, fire, air, and water. By the time we got to the 1800s, it was recognized that dozens of elements were created of all of matter. Now, eventually, hundreds would be discovered. And today we have what's called the periodic table of elements. Now, the, the important thing here for my work uh, is I've circled the, the number in the top left you know, for every element. Just a reminder is the proton count, uh, or sometimes uh, given the letter uh, Z. But we'll come back to that in a little bit. So simplification. We know that all matter is simplified to molecules that are made of atomic elements, and that those elements are made from three particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. But again, it's the proton that determines the type of element, hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, et cetera. It's based on the proton. Now, with that being said, uh, now we jump to the complexity of particles, and that's the, the current standard model. And the question is why? If nature was simplified as we went from the largest objects all the way down to the atom. Why is it that over the last half century, since particle accelerators were able to smash atoms, that hundreds of particles have been found? Right, The atom was simplified, but yet hundreds when she starts smashing the components of the atom. That eventually to the standard model. I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the standard model, but just to recap, 17 elementary particles grouped into, into the table, quarks, you know, forces, uh, and leptons. And leptons I'm going to cover in a little bit more detail. So just a reminder on leptons, that is the electron family and the neutrino family. So the electron, the muon, the tau, and then the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino make up the lepton family. But I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, the standard model is often referred to as the most successful particle theory to date. But that being said, right, I think those that are working on the standard model know that there are issues that it can't explain. So this is the work that's still going on, such as gravity, dark matter, and dark energy. So those are the known issues. But despite that, we also have to, have to remember the standard model was not able to predict many things and has had to be corrected. Now, there's probably many of these, but I'm going to pick on just one, uh, and you'll see why in, in, in my work. Standard model was not able to predict the mass. It's since been changed, um, but also wasn't able to predict that the neutrino could become larger to become the muon neutrino and the tau neutrino in a process known as oscillation. All right. So the current issues, there are issues 
issues that it wasn't able to predict. But this is the one thing that still bugs me. There are further issues that are completely ignored. And so if the standard model is supposed to contain elementary particles, and those are things like neutrinos and electrons and quarks, so the question is, if they are truly elementary, then why? One, during high energy collisions of elementary electrons, right, quarks are produced. And I have the reference down there at the bottom. So again, quarks are supposed to be elementary. So how is it possible that electrons can be producing quarks when they are, are uh, producing colliders? And in some cases, harder to spot, but neutrinos have also been produced in collisions of electrons. And again, the same question, how is it possible that electrons can produce neutrinos if each and every one of these are supposed to be elementary? And I think these next two are more familiar because this is the decay process. But a reminder, a neutron is supposedly made of three quarks, but yet when it decays, an electron and an anti-neutrino are ejected. And the same thing for a proton, right? Three quarks, but yet when it decays, somehow a positron and a neutrino emerge. And if we were to put all this together and just send this data to someone that's outside of particle physics, but understands logic, I mean, logic would just have, it would just tell you that these can't be elementary particles if they're producing each other. And so really, that, that's what bugs me. And led me to question, you know, when I started my work, which is why, you know, why is that possible? So with that as a background, I'll go through my work now. Right? And I've, my work is really an attempt to simplify uh, a new model for subatomic particles. Uh, and I expanded my work, so I'm gonna have to give credit to Dr. Milo Wolf and Gabriel Lafreniere, both of which were doing their work independently of each other until uh, later in, in his uh, life, Lafreniere found Dr. Wolf's work, but they were really done independently. And my work, I've given it a name, Energy Wave Theory, or you might you know, hear me refer to it as EWT for short. Uh, but again, it started with the, this premise, right? That particles are standing waves of energy. And the image that you see there from Lafreniere is a computer simulation that he wrote. So, you know, he was able to get this down to simple math and then write computer simulations that have standing waves of energy, right? And a standing wave is stored energy, which I think we can measure as mass. And beyond that, it breaks down to traveling waves. And so I've circled that, which would be what would be a perimeter of standing waves. Now, all of this was done by Wolf and Lafreniere uh, long before I started my work. And so it looks a little bit like this. If the animation is still working for you, you should see the, the traveling waves disappear and now circled what would be that stored energy because that's what a standing wave is. And so this was my hypothesis, all right? Could all particles be a result of different standing wave combinations and energy values such that if you were to merge multiple particles together, such as a particle collider, could they merge to become a larger standing wave, maybe a larger both in volume as well as the energy that it contains in wave amplitude? Could it transition to be a different particle? So that was my hypothesis. So my work started with math. And the, the first assumption was particles are standing waves uh, of uh, longitudinal waves of energy. And that came from Wolf and, and Lafreniere. I expanded that to say our photons then would be traveling uh, transverse waves of energy. Those are the two equations that are used today to represent energy. So I took that and then put it into a wave equation. I was able to derive each of these and you can see the URLs at the very bottom. Um, but I'm gonna not talk about the derivations, I'm gonna talk about uh, what the work produced. So in that energy equation you see there, rho or p is, uh, is density, v is volume, c is the speed of light, um, lambda is wavelength, and a is amplitude. And I put a little box there on the right, but essentially for any 
chosen volume, you can measure the energy with four parameters, amplitude, speed, wavelength of a wave in a known density. So I started with that. And then I made two key assumptions before I get to the results of my work. The, the first is that an elementary particle is responsible for all other particles, right? And took that from the model of the atom, you know, sim similar to the proton. Uh, one proton is hydrogen, six is carbon, et cetera. And in atomic elements, the that proton count is given the letter Z. So I just found a, a letter that, uh, you know, wasn't being used as often in physics and called it K. So in this model, K is a particle count equivalent to Z, which is the atomic number or the number of protons in an atom. So I did that, but here I made an assumption that with the more elementary particles or uh, the higher number of K, if you will, uh, that might reside in a particle that it increases the wave amplitude and the wavelength, which then affects the volume being measured. And you can see that in the equation from the page before. So I, I took all of this, put it together, and this was the result. It's a linearization of particle energies, all the particles, ranging from the smallest known one, very bottom left, I know this is probably gonna be small fun, hard to read, but you see the URL at the bottom of my page. You can see how the calculations were done, as well as the uh, image uh, that you can blow up and, and see in a higher resolution. But all the particles from the neutrino to the Higgs are listed here. And the very bottom, you see the particle number, or I was given a K. On, on the left-hand side, you see the energy value in electron volts. The amazing thing about this is that it's now linear. And I'll do a comparison here so you understand why I think this is significant. Oh, sorry, one thing I need to point out before I move to the next slide, which is it only becomes linear if you take that particle number K uh, to the fifth power. And I think that's why it wasn't uh, easy to, to spot. And, and the reason why it's the fifth power is the assumption that I mentioned on the previous page, which is that it increases amplitude, wavelength, but it also then increases the volume that is being measured uh, because it extends the standing wave uh, volume out um, from the center as is proportional to the number of particle numbers K. And that's why I believe that it's K to the fifth. But I, I wanna show you the comparison. So it's linearization here based on particle number. And the reason why I started you know, with the simplification of atomic elements is this. And if we think back to a century ago, as the periodic table was formed and new elements were being discovered, those elements could be predicted based on this linearization, right? The, the proton number there at the bottom and the energy mass uh, on the vertical axis you see there. It's identical to, to the work I was doing to linearize subatomic particles. But there's something even more amazing as I put all this together, I recognize that there were similarities between atomic elements and particles. So I put it into another periodic table, but I call this one the periodic table of particles. And in the top left corner there, instead of hydrogen, you see the neutrino. And as you work your way to the bottom of the table, you see the Higgs. There's some red squares I'm gonna hit on the next page, but you see that there's a lot of empty space here which is actually the scary thing, which means that, you know, as we increase the energy for particle accelerators, we're probably gonna see more particles and more people win Nobel Prize awards, uh, but it's really only gonna get more complex. And I think it's already complex enough. You'll see a lot of the particles are kind of clumped together, beginning with number 44, you know, probably up to about 50 or so. And that's really not too surprising since a lot of these particles are found uh, from smashing protons together. So they tend to be about the same uh, energy or K values in this case. So the key thing to remember here before I move on to the next slide is a bunch of empty spaces, but those red boxes, why did I uh, circle those? 
Well, besides particles being linearized, which I think itself is, is amazing, uh, there were more coincidences that I found. Those red boxes have the numbers 2, 8, 20, 28, and 50. And if you remember those numbers, it's because they're the magic numbers from atomic elements, you know, the, one, the numbers that tend to be more stable for either proton or uh, proton-neutron combination. And what, what's interesting is that the lepton family, right, the electrons and the neutrinos, are found in the periodic table of uh, particles that I put together at those numbers. So something about those numbers you know, means more, more stability, which is why we also see those particles as leptons. And two more things about it. One, the, the Higgs falls you know, nearly at the end of the table. Reminder, there's 118 elements in the periodic table of elements, and the Higgs is at about 117 in the one that put together. And then lastly, the, the slopes are nearly the same. It's, it's not quite. But in the particles one that I put together, it's about 2.4x you know, for the slope. And for atomic elements, it's about 2.6x. So anyway, so those are the coincidences that I found. And you, and you can read more about it at the paper that's uh, found in the URL below. The math, all right, and that, that's the data. So the question is, all right, what can we interpret from that? And, and I think the model, to me, it means it's very, very similar to atomic elements. And so the neutrino is very likely to be the elementary particle, similar to uh, hydrogen you know, being the first element with one, one proton. And that's because the, that graph only works out when you start at about 2.39 electron volts, uh, which is roughly about the range of the neutrino. Now, it also explains more which is now if you take two particles and collide them, and this occurs at lower energies naturally, right? such as solar neutrinos that are coming from the sun and bombarding Earth all the time, as they're traveling, of course they would have the random chance of, of merging and colliding together, and I believe that's what we see as oscillation, when a neutrino can suddenly become larger to become a muon neutrino or a tau neutrino. But there's only a certain amount of energy uh, that we have coming from the sun. So it takes larger energies, like what's produced at CERN, to be able to smash a lot more of these particles together to get a higher K value. The problem with the particle accelerators is that these particles will decay very, very quickly because they're not stable. And it is my belief that they're not in a geometrically stable arrangement, which is why they decay quickly. We do see geometric arrangements that are somewhat uh, stable, and those are leptons. So again, the neutrino family and the electron family, which is why I think that they occur at magic numbers, 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, as I mentioned earlier. And you can see here where, where they are mapped. Now, the other interesting thing about this, you see the neutrino, the muon neutrino at 8 and the tau neutrino at 20. These are numbers that are uh, dual tetrahedrons, right? The muon neutrino is uh, at 8 would be a two-level uh, tetrahedron, and then you stack on the other side. There's, there's symmetry here. And the neutrino family is, does not have charge, whereas the electron family has charge, and that makes the, it's the difference. So these are stable geometries, but yet one is symmetrical and the other is not. And it's my belief that that's what leads to, to charge. So that's what I'm able to interpret so far from, from the data. Or to use common sense, knowing that the stable configurations happen to be around certain numbers, and those numbers are tetrahedral patterns. If we were to group everything now, start with the neutrino as the elementary particle. The electron in that model had a, a K value of 10, and 10 is a three-level uh, tetrahedron. So I think that's why the electron is stable, in my opinion. 
Now, as we build this, electrons can form protons. This is maybe maybe a future topic for me. I do have a URL that, that's in there, but I have a model for the proton uh, where the energy uh, can be attributed to, to electrons and the decay process. Uh, that's, that's, uh, it's actually a long topic which uh, I could cover perhaps in the future, but the point for this slide is that it's a two tetrahedron for electrons at vertices. So everything, it's neighbor building upon itself at this point. And as we know, protons form the core of atoms and the different atomic elements. And again, at certain magic numbers, we know that those atoms are more stable. And then lastly, molecules. Molecules tend to take the same shape, you know, forming linear or triangular or tetrahedral structures, and that's really the simplest 1D or 2D or 3D structures. And so it's my belief that, history, that nature is just building upon itself, and what we've seen and, and known in molecules and atomic nuclei structure are actually taking place in things that we can't see, all the way down to protons, electrons, and how they might be built from a simple elementary particle. Now, what I covered here was just the so particles just lost for... your presentation. Okay. Right. Did you guys also lose the presentation? Did you lose the presentation? So you can still hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah I lost the presentation. Lost the presentation. There was, uh, presentation there was apparently a glitch, right, Juan? Yeah, so you might want to restart your screen sharing, stop it and start it. Let's see if we can get your presentation back. Do you see it? I see it. Do you know, Franklin? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I don't see it. Let me. Uh... Yeah, there oh, was I some kind it. of a interruption or a glitch. But I've got it back here. All okay. I see is a. All I see is a presentation of all the members that are participating. All the little squares with yeah. the, the initials. Yeah, that's all I see as well. I see. I see okay. now the connection from particles to molecules makes sense. So I think some people oh, were frozen that. and some people lost it. So Jeff, if you could uh, stop your sharing and restart, let's see if that gets it working. Stop sharing. Sorry about the little technical glitch okay. here. Share okay, screen. Now again. So uh, if you have some questions, please put those in the chat so we can get to those at the end. That's what my recommendation. Yeah, I'm only, I'm only a few slides away from uh, ending anyway. Uh, so yeah, bear with me. Let's let's check, make sure that this works again. Uh, you should I see now my... a connection from particles. Yeah. Yes, we can see that. So go ahead. All right. I won't talk through this again. Um, because hopefully you heard heard me. But in case some somebody lost it while I was doing this animation. I'm just going to show all of these again. All right, so again, the point here on this slide was that I believe nature is just building on itself from the smallest particle to what we see as molecules. Now, that's the work that I did on subatomic particles. Um, yeah, I was able to take that same equation that I started with for particles and uh, do a lot more with it. I'm planning to cover these topics today. Um, be happy to get into detail either on questions or, or come back with um, more of a presentation on these. They do have forces worked into the model, electric and magnetic and gravitational and strong. Um, the one thing I don't have uh, thus far is the weak force. We've got 250 plus photon energies and 450 plus atomic orbital distances all calculated. Um, but only from hydrogen to, to calcium. I'm still having problems uh, going beyond uh, a calcium, and the primary reason is that's when it transitions to the first d orbital. I um, haven't quite figured that one out. Um, some of the things that you'll find within uh, the EWT models, the same equation can be used to derive uh, 22 fundamental, uh, fundamental physical constants, such as the gravitational constant or the Planck, Planck constant but they were simplified into just five, the same five um, uh, EWT constants such as wavelength and amplitude that I mentioned earlier, everything has been simplified. And the last thing is uh, six of the classical energy and force equations I showed you two earlier. But if you want any of the details, there is a URL 
low and you can click through to uh, various parts of the website to see the derivations or the calculations. Um, I'm gonna wrap up with just a couple of slides, right? Because when we compare it to the, the standard model, which again, I, I explained why I think it's incredibly complex, um, the, the EWT model only requires three spatial dimensions, only one elementary particle, which is probably the neutrino, and one principal cause of motion, which I, I did not get into details there, but I'd be happy to in the future. Now you compare that to the standard model. And in the standard model, according to string theory at least, there's 11 spatial dimensions, which we'll likely never be able to measure you know, or, or confirm that they're there. The standard model itself has 17 elementary particles and four forces, causes of motion, right? strong, weak, gravity, and electromagnetic. So the EWT model is, is a lot simpler. And not only in explanation, but also in math. Uh, the equation, everything that I've done derives from this equation. But yeah, it does become a little bit more complex than that, but everything comes down to just this one equation you see there on the left. And if you compare that to the standard model equation, which I have there on the right, it's, it's very long and, and very confusing with a lot of different parameters that can be tweaked. And that's the difference, and that's the you know, reason why I get inspired to continue to work on, on uh, EWT in, in my spare time, which is to try to make sense of it all and to make it simple. Because it's, it's my firm belief here that the universe is simple, and it's man that has made it complex. And with that, I, I really, truly appreciate your time. And if you want more information, I'm providing two more years. URLs there below. One is to the website that I referred to, and the other is to the YouTube site. About a year ago, David convinced me to do a, a YouTube site concerning it, but um, I would appreciate any of your feedback on the videos that I've been creating. And so I'll stop there and, and uh, be happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you, Jeff, for that presentation. And uh, so we'll have about an hour for quest answers and questions. This conference will go to uh, at least 8.45 today. So uh, I, the floor is open for questions. I think Harry raised his flag during the presentation. And then Michael. I have a number of questions, but my first comment is, Jeff, um, I really don't like it when people launch into a dissertation and they don't tell us uh, about their background What's your background? What kind of, you know, and how and why did you get interested in this topic? Are you a physicist? Uh, were you trained as a physicist or not? Uh, could you give us, uh, you know, something about your education, your background, and how you got involved in this? Oh, well, sure. Um, <laughs> yes, that's a very good point. Uh, I, I have another say. comment, too, which mm -hmm. is that there's a distortion that I'm hearing, which I think is either caused by you're talking too loud or talking too fast. Okay, so it was still garbled even during the presentation? Yes, uh, I, a lot of it was garbled for me. It was okay for me. Right now I'm actually hearing a little bit more garbling than during the presentation. All right. It, it was okay, and it's still understandable at least. So try to speak more slowly and and so we can figure out where what we don't hear correctly. Uh, my apologies. We did a audio check at the very beginning, and I thought everything was working. And then we got to the presentation, and for some reason, it was garbled. Um, I should have led with my background. My, uh, that, yeah, that's my mistake. So my background is undergraduate, at least, was um, engineering. So I do have a technical background. Uh, my master's, I switched into into business, and for my my field, uh, I work for a telecommunications equipment supplier called ZTE. So, I'm uh, the vice president of innovation, and I go out and look for interesting technologies for wireless communications. So you're basically kind of an electrical engineer sort of guy, right? Uh, mechanical with with a decent background background in electrical, yes. All right. Now to, now to my specific question. What do you mean by a standing wave? Um, 
that it kind of a lot of people don't know what a standing wave is. I've learned from experience in talking about standing waves. And I'm not really sure what you mean by standing wave. And I had a question about your fundamental equation. Um, how about we do first the question on standing waves, and then um, I'll answer the question on the equation second. So I have just transitioned to the uh, website. Is it still coming through, my screen sharing? Yes, it's, we see your website. OK. Now, a standing wave, let's start first with the uh, image you see on the, the black and, and red. Standing wave is really a wave that's not moving. It's going up and down. But it's a result of two waves, an in wave and an out wave, uh, roughly the same frequency. So that's what the sine wave version would look like. But when I was talking about uh, what was developed uh, from Dr. Milo Wolf and Gabriel Lafreniere, their longitudinal waves. And so the image of those little dots and particles that you see there would be a longitudinal standing wave. It's just a lot harder to imagine what that looks like until you see the sine wave representation here. Well, that's usually described as like a sound waves in uh, resonant tubes, like in an organ pipe. Wave is a longitudinal wave. Yes, a sound wave is. So you would have standing waves in, uh, or a musical instrument's another example of standing waves um, that are involving sound. Now, do your, is your wave, what I'm not real clear on is you say it's a standing wave of energy, and my puzzlement is what kind of energy? Yeah, so energy would just be defined defined as the movement of these, of the ether. So I, am, I do subscribe uh, to the ether theory. And so the black dots that you see there, if you imagine something being the substance of the ether, it's the motion of those in a, in a periodic pattern, which becomes a, a wave, all right? It has a displacement with a wavelength and amplitude. So Jeff, are you still there? I think you, you we did hear you. Talking, you didn't hear me? I think you just got cut for a little bit. So you might want to repeat what you just said for about the last 10 seconds. Yeah, so my point was the, uh, the ether. The ether must have a substance. And if we assume it has a substance such as these black dots that you see here on the screen, the energy is really the movement it's defined as the movement of those particles in a periodic form, which has a wavelength and amplitude. So my question on your standing wave as a particle, is that like in your illustration here, in order to have a standing wave, there must be some constraining box. You know, as a violinist, I know that there's this, I create a standing wave, and that standing wave is generated between the, you know, the top of my violin and the bridge. But uh, for an electron or, or any other you know, neutrino, <coughs> uh, what, is, what do you think is the containing box? This is maybe a better, uh, it's their spherical waves. The, the box itself, so first off, how are those waves become standing? And so the, the answer to that, actually, I don't have this one in animated. It looks something like this, where the, the ether has the motion. This is the first law where I just call it ether granules. That comes uh, from a term from Gabriel Lafreniere. But as, as a wave moves, it moves in the direction of propagation. So you know, imagine you know, sound waves as they bounce air molecules from one to the next to the next. Now, at some point, those air molecules may bounce off something. Let's put a balloon, for example, something that's very elastic. Let's put a balloon in the middle of the room. At some point, the sound wave is going to bounce off of that. And that has a term called the wave center. And again, this. This term comes from Dr. Myla Wolf, so I'm trying not to invent new terms, but just reuse terms from some of the pioneers in this work. Now, if you assume, I'm going to keep with that, that sound wave example because it's more visual, we can see it. If you can imagine sound waves you know, moving as longitudinal waves to the point where it reflects off of something, it can become a standing wave. 
maybe you have an in wave and an out wave now being reflected at the same frequency. The the radius, which I think is your your question, uh, Franklin, is how far out can those stand wave uh, so can the standing wave go? Because eventually, as it bounces off, it will not maintain a standing wave for infinity, uh, and that's really a function of of the elasticity of that balloon, or in, in my case, uh, how many balloons you might have grouped together in one because the standing that's waves that's actually become larger. Problem here, maybe you carries in that you know, if you have like a pulsating balloon, I, I can understand how that generates outgoing waves. And but that seems to be a completely different phenomenon from standing waves where you have a reflection. I mean, is it just the pulsating bolt? A balloon that you're talking about because if it is then I would say that that's not a standing wave it generates a wave but it's just purely an outgoing wave so how how is that that's standing when it just seems to be an outgoing wave yeah uh, it's the same thing I was trying to give an example of a longitudinal wave but there's the same thing as uh, taking a rope and fixing it at one end and you shake the rope and it, uh, it First, as a wave towards the the fixed end, you know, such as a wall, uh, and then as it's reflected, as it's elastic, uh, it will create a standing wave. Uh, so it's a reflection. Think of it as a in wave being reflected uh, to become an out wave, and the combination of those two produce a standing wave. Uh, and that can be yeah, illustrated well, with with a simple rope. Well, what I'm having a hard time understanding is that everything that you're showing is not that. What, what you're showing is just purely an outgoing longitudinal wave. Because that's what I'm asking, if it is a standing wave, then you do need to have someone else holding the end of the rope. And, um, but I don't see the end of the rope. All I see is just an unrestrained rope that you just wag it at one end and it just goes all the way to the other. If there were no losses, it would just go on forever. Uh, so that's yeah, so, not a standing wave in my opinion. Yeah, so the, in, in this case, Imagine what's called a wave center. Uh, again, a term from Dr. Milo Wolf. Imagine that wave center is that reflecting point. So it's the equivalent of, of fixing something to the wall. That's what it reflects off of. Uh, no, I mean, I can understand the wave center if I take a ball and I wave it to the left and the right. That will generate a longitudinal waves to the left and the right. The, the ball itself is not... Uh, uh, reflecting anything, it's just it's generating it. Well, I, think, I, I, think understand, we're, we're I understand what he's terms talking here. about, Franklin. What he's saying is, is at the end of the, you have to think about it like I have a stick in my hand and I'm waving the stick back and forth, but the end of the stick isn't attached to anything. Are you still cocky? You might have gotten cut out. You're talking I about talking. Well, essentially, his standing wave is a, is has an impedance at the at the outer end that it's free. It's a free at the other end. So it's like waving a stick, okay, which has nothing attached to the end of the stick. But is that a standing wave, do you think? I mean, maybe this is just a definitional thing, but uh, I'm just not getting how that's a standing wave. I, I know. I've, this is Corey. I, I view, like I, I've mentioned before, like a raindrop on the surface of water. Bingo. The focal point to the center will bob up and down and stay in place, and the waves will have high and low points between them. It's a, this this graph that uh, Jeff has up now will probably show that pretty good if he if he can animate it. Yeah, but that problem is that that's a, a progressive wave that's moving outward. You can have inward and outward wave uh, standing waves from matter and antimatter flux densities. Yeah, well, but, uh, I, I, I think I, that I think that with. Franklin has brought up is kind of the issue of trying to understand what what the what the boundary condition is that creates the standing wave. That's what he's asking. Yeah, exactly. But I don't see a boundary condition like in this animation. I mean, I would not consider this ripples on water a standing wave. 
Uh, well, the boundary suggest... condition is like on the third a third image there shows shows that the the focal point of the wave becomes if if you have energy coming inwards, it has uh, it it amplifies because it, the energy is focused towards a point. So the at the center, your wave is going to be strongest. But since the med media ca can no longer handle such stress, it weakens, and so the you you create basically the boundary condition is the limitation of the media itself to carry the mm. wave and by stressing the center you're weakening that central point of the of the media so much that it now becomes essentially like a void in the middle of the media and we all know that waves cannot move through a void so that void in the middle where it's extremely stressed becomes the very boundary condition that the wave reflects off of and goes back out from. Wow. Wow. Well, I think basically one would need to refer to the uh, work of the two gentlemen that Jeff referred to um, to really understand where the standing wave arises. Yeah. That's my conclusion. Yeah, and, and basically that's Milo Wolf is uh, what was my inspiration about ten, eight years ago or so as I was looking into standing waves. Uh, my standing waves became strictly waves in a contractible, in a, in a tensionable media. And that solved the issue of not worrying about trying to initiate a wave from a point, but actually the waves that then would become focused to a point. I think uh, I've lost the image here, the screen again. Uh, like we had before. You know, Cornelius, is my, my understanding is that this is sort of like a drum head. I think you've used that analogy before. The issue with uh, banging on a drum and that sort of thing is, is that you created boundary condition at the rim of the drum. Okay. And that's what's used to solve the differential equations because at the boundary, there's no emotion. OK, it's fixed. And so you can create the boundary condition there that the waves are reflecting off of the rim of the drum back to the center. OK, and that's how you get the standing wave. And what Franklin is asking is what creates that reflection or boundary condition that causes the wave to reflect back? Yes, that would be my question. Also, Michael also has a raise his flag. Uh, well, I was wondering about uh, if he has in his work on uh, subatomic particles done any uh, work on quasi particles. Uh, I'm particularly interested in that because I'm a, I have my own ether model, which uh, involves uh, elemental ether units, which uh, which align and and train and otherwise link up to form etheroidal units and my theory of her uh, quasi particles is that they are uh, semi reactive qu uh, quantally but unreactive etheroidally and that they they're emerged they've been extruded from a, a vibrational underlying vibration what, what's interest. a quasi particle well this is a uh, it's in particle physics it's in uh, physics uh, laboratories they've, they've they've observed these wildly acting uh, Quasi, well, it's like Quasimodo, the uh, hunchback of Notre Dame. He had all kinds of uh, deformities and disfigurements, and he didn't fit into the, uh, you know, the, the oh, population, and so that he that he was called Quasimodo. Well, quasi particles are don't quite fit into anything. They they are semi-reactive to uh, quantum energies. So my theory is that they they have been extruded from uh, an underlying ether. Uh, uh, energy system, which is uh, vibrational, and it didn't fit in there at all, and has been extruded into this. Well, you can look it up; it's in Wikipedia and everywhere about quasi so, Q U A S I particles. So, just to go off on that quasi particle oscillation, I'm reading this book from Space and um, uh, Space Time Gravity. A quasi particle is defined as a simple quadrupolar oscillating consisting of two different masses placed on x axis with an equilibrium position x equals plus or minus b so you in the quasi particle you have to have a mass and an anti-mass for that to work so if you have a neutrino you can have an anti-neutrino you have to have the two polar regions to vibrate each other which goes with the standing model 
Well, the references I've I've consulted have not been that definitive or, or you know clear about just what quasi. They're still trying to figure out what quasi particles really are, and like I say, my theory, my model of the ether says that they're etheroidal in origin and that they did they've been extruded from an etheroidal uh, energy system, which is vibrational and and they similarly they somewhat fit into the quantum. Uh, energy world of uh, distance vectors and waves and so on. And so they act wildly and uh, they can't really be defined. At least Wikipedia would, would disagree with the uh, definition, you know, the uh, clear-cut definition you just gave about quasi-particles. That they're very mysterious, actually. Yeah, yeah the, the, it, the, the, me, the means that the observable dragging force is an oscillator is the tidal force. I mean, we're talking about the ether as basically the surface of the water. And whenever you have an oscillation between a quasi-particle of matter and antimatter, if that be a neutrino or antineutrino or a, a proton or an antiproton or an electron or a positron, you have to have a ripple in the ether, which is essentially the most it's the fundamental sea of potential, which is what is the potential? That's well, I have question. my own model of an ether, which is it was originally a universal oscillation of of uh, point localities, which transitioned to uh, a universal ether uh, as the oscillations trans uh, uh, were changed to uh, vibrations, and uh, the outward vibrations came into contact, creating a, a elemental uh, ether uh, world, uh, which. Uh, Alignments and um, and uh, entrainments and other other uh, linkages form etheroidal, and then eventually all, all the way up to quantum units. And that quant the quantum world of of uh, our, our present atomic quantum world is actually creational. A, uh, a structured uh, quantum environment was needed because the previous world of ether and ether macrocosm was unstable magnetically, and so they had to. Uh, uh, the creator had to uh, had to um, send electrons into a virgin ether uh, region, which uh, quantized the entire region chain reactionally and formed the uh, our present world of of quantum uh, atomic uh, energies. Okay, uh, so that that's that's great, but I'd just like to remind the participants in the interest of time that uh, please keep your comments about what Jeff is talking about. And uh, uh, while we welcome you to express your opinions about your theories, to not go into very long length in them. Well, it's hard to discuss quasi-particles without discussing an ether uh, behind it. I, I don't know. It's, I'm sorry if I overdid it. but I'll say so. Alistair has a question. Holy moly. Yeah, can you, you hear me? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Um, Jeff, you mentioned um, Milo Wolf and Gabriel Lafreniere. Have you also familiar with John Mackin? No. And how how does your um, your theory, your thoughts, compare to those of Lafreniere? And Wolf, are they are they the same, or have you brought a unique twist, something different? Yeah. So, in, in I, I'm sorry that I missed the the first half hour. Oh, okay. Oh yeah. So I started. Uh, if you missed the first half hour, uh, I did explain the uh, Wolf's work and and the Frenier's work, how it inspired mine. Uh, where I have um, extended it would be both modeled the electron as standing waves. Uh, but I, I went for a simpler model where, where it maybe originates from a smaller particle, and that was the neutrino. I'm not sure if you where you joined in that discussion around the neutrino possibly being the fundamental particle. That, would, that part would be uh, an extension of their work. Uh, the model of the proton, which I, I only scratched the surface, uh, was an extension of Lafreniere's work. Okay, great. And and I'm sorry that I showed up late. And I'll uh, offline. I'll I'll look into your work. I was a actually late because I had sent off this morning. A, a, I was busy sending off an email to uh, to Mr. Wolf and the other one to M M John John Mackin. 
I think that his work would interest you greatly too. It's very um, e either the same or very similar. Oh, if you sent an email to Dr. Wolf, uh, he, he won't be responding. He passed away a few years ago. Oh dear, well that's sad to hear. I, I did see that he was 95 according to the the what I was reading and I, I thought, well, you know, that, that could be an any day kind of situation. But that that's unfortunate because he certainly yeah. sees the right patterns as far as I could tell. But but so does this gentleman, John Mack, and you might want to check into him. He's only in his 70s, so he's going to be around for a while yet, hopefully. I will. Okay, so Ian, you have uh, your flag up. Yes, th thank you, Franklin. Um, just two points. For, first, um, I think you derived your fundamental equation from E equals MC squared and the Planck relationship E equals H nu or HF. I'm just wondering if you uh, conceive of the possibility that there might be a proportionality constant in there. I mean, uh, experimental results have shown that there's an order of magnitude relationship between um, the in in a reaction in a in a nuclear reaction the change in in the mass and the change in the energy but it hasn't actually proved contrary to what the textbooks say it hasn't proved that there is an exact um uh, uh, relationship equivalence between e and mc squared so for example some theoretical calculations put a factor in Hassenhurl, for example, looking at black body radiation has equals four thirds MC squared. So that's my first point. I'm just wondering if you could conceive of a constant being put into that equation. Uh, the second point is just following from the most recent co conversation there is you've mentioned the ether a couple of times and I wonder what you conceive the ether as being um, composed of. Yeah, so for the first question, Oh, now I hear oh, now an, echo. I an echo. Okay, Continue. you can mute your cough. For the first question, I I don't see actually any proportionality uh, constants now, because uh, I, I was able to derive uh, those. That it's on the website. Um, I'll, I'll send a maybe a URL after this, since I'm not doing screen sharing now, to the fundamental physical constants, but. Uh, I was able to remove all the proportionality constants, and not just G and, and H, but but some others as well. Uh, the answer to your your second question, uh, yeah, what's in the ether? Uh, it's still a difficult one because uh, we can't see it, probably never will. But I think it's just down to just two components. You know, something that allows uh, the wave or the energy to be transferred in the direction of motion and then something that eventually reflects it. And I think that's where we got stuck on a topic about how a standing wave is, is created. But I, I think that just comes down to those two simple components for the ether. Do you ascribe any properties to it, any physical properties? Yeah, a density property. Um, so actually, there's two two properties. One is a density, and there's a the density calculation is also... I, here, maybe I should go back to screen sharing so I can refer to something on a website. Give me a moment. Uh, but there are two properties. One is the... Um, so this is the energywavetheory.com website. That's what I'm on right now. And if I go to... Yeah, if I, I can't see I'm your not screen. Anything I don't know if anybody else can. Or oh. yeah, I think some of us are just seeing the participants list. Oh, shoot. Um, Unfortunately, uh, you I, might have to initialize it again. Yeah, I'll... Uh, okay, let me try it one more time then. I'll stop screen sharing and then start again. Yeah, stop and start and everyone turn off their video because we're definitely having some bandwidth challenges today. Then the URL out if this doesn't work. But I just started screen sharing again. Is it working this time? Uh, no. Uh, that don't worry. I'll, I'll send, oh, I, was that a yes from someone? Yeah, uh, this is Harry Ripper. I see it. Um, some people are seeing it and some not. Oh, okay. Well, to answer your question, um, yeah, there's two properties. One is a density property for those that can see it. I'm highlighting it there. Um, and then also the uh, the particle number that I referred to in, uh, in the presentation, a uh, value that I gave K. Those would be two properties of the ether itself. The others are... Um, Wave, wave constants. 
Okay, so it looks like uh, looks like uh, I still got the picture, but it's not updating. Yeah, maybe. Oh, okay, so you can't see this. I, I will send a URL to answer that question. Uh, Could you just call out page. the uh, value of the density for those of us who haven't seen it? What's the order of magnitude of the density? I suppose it's yeah. pretty high, isn't it? It's very low, very low. It's um, 10 to the minus 30 kilograms per meters cubed is the units. Okay, so Cornelius, you raised your flag. And then um, Bill. Uh, basically, I started, uh, like I said, with Milo Wolf also, and I had I had difficulty understanding how Milo Wolf and that uh, managed to get the waves to focus to a point. And so I struggled with that for quite a while, and I was wondering how you uh, came up to the conclusion that like a plain wave, uh, that is, is just a straight wave, can actually turn and, and focus itself to a point. I did. I did come up with a conclusion of my own, which I've kind of expressed in the past. But I was wondering if you, were, if you could explain how it is that it focuses to become a point, so that it can come back out from that point, or is it required yeah. that there's a seed there for that to focus to? No, um, I believe it's uh, a it Huygens principle. That there are just different wavelets that then form a wavefront. Um, they converge on, on what Wolf calls a wave center, and, and that's when the wave front is reflected. But I, what, I got, again, I wish I could do screen sharing because I've got an image of this on the site, but it doesn't seem to be working. What's the physical cause, the mechanism that caused them to become focused, though? Because, you know, normally they would just actually become dispersive. Most waves uh, would become dispersive. Yeah, I think the, the I think. The answer would be the waves are traveling in many different directions, and you've got waves that are. If you take a point, uh, then you've got uh, multiple different wave wavelets, if you will, uh, converging to become a wave from just at that point. But if you were also measure other points within the universe, you'd see that waves continue to flow in many different directions. Uh, I wish screen sharing was working. I'd, I'd show you an animation. So, so basically, you're coming up with that. That is basically the origin of all these of this focused wave is the fact that there are just multiple waves that are focused towards that point. It's not a it's it's not a self perpetuating yeah. situation. No, it's that the waves are continually going throughout the the universe. And in fact, the um, uh, elsewhere, I didn't cover forces today, but that's the. the it's essentially the electric force, and it's tra you know just traveling everywhere in every, every different direction. Yeah, and this is why I came up with a tension force rather than a compression force, because the tension force does automatically, in a, in a tensionable heat media, does become focused towards the weakest point in the field. And so tension waves are focusable and self-focusing two points. So that's uh, that's a, that's a the difference that I made from Milo Wolf's beginning point. Yeah, but it sounds like we have the same origin. So it looks like Jim Martson, you have some questions in the chat. Did you want to just uh, relate those to Jeff? He might have a problem with the microphone. So his uh, questions are, are. There you are, Jim. Hey, Jim. Hello, can you hear me? We hear you. We hear you. Yeah, I uh, was just curious uh, with your um, ether concept, if you um, consider the density of the ether uh, as a function of the uh, gravitational potential, local gravitational potential. Uh, well, it's all, uh, it's all, it's all tied, it's to, tied it. to it. The, every, the, everything, everything, everything. Oh, I get the echo again. Uh, that's, I'll, I'll continue. I'll power through and ignore the echo. The density property is in every equation, including gravity. Uh, so I guess in some respects, you can say, yes, it, uh, it's certainly a property of gravity. OK, so Bill, you have a question. Bill yeah, Lucas? I would like to uh, compliment uh, Jeff on uh, uh, how he was able to talk about these issues uh, with his background, and uh, I come from a different background. I'm a theoretical physicist, and uh, I worked a number of years at the Space Radiation Effects Laboratory, which is a, the world's most advanced accelerator center, 
uh, for 15 years, replacing CERN at that time. And uh, um, but um, um, when you were giving the history of these things, uh, you because you don't have a background in theoretical physics, you probably never read any of the Greek documents and things of that sort from the past. And uh, the uh, the Greeks uh, cite um, uh, Moshi, and uh, he had a uh, theory of monads. And there were two types of monads, a monad and an anti-monad. And all forms of matter, all elementary particles, uh, as you would call them, um, are made of various geometrical combinations of these. And because of the significance of the ge geometry, uh, the uh, what, what they uh, had in their day of the of the Greeks was not a university, but uh, uh, their uh, places of study. They uh, had a sign over them saying, "Let no one ignorant of geometry enter here." And that was because they believed that the structure of all elementary particles was due to various geometrical combinations of these monads. And uh, the monad was not <clears throat> very well understood experimentally in those days, but in the days of Arthur Compton and his last graduate student, Winston Bostick, uh, the monad was discovered experimentally to be the soliton of the electromagnetic field. And the soliton is a, a, a long-lived standing wave. And uh, so it, uh, um, it's uh, uh, only way to get rid of it is to bring a soliton and an anti-soliton together so that they annihilate one another. And, uh, but uh, many of the things you've expressed, many of the ideas, are, have various compatibilities with that uh, uh, work that was done and, uh, in the past. And by the way, not only did the Greeks record that, but also the Indian Jains did too. And so that work on the monad is uh, over 3,000 years old. So it's, uh, it's very interesting. And uh, in the 15th and 16th century uh, AD, <laughs> uh, we find people starting to uh, use that uh, in, in, in science. Uh, and, uh, but with the changes in the scientific method starting in about the 1850s, uh, we rewrote the history of science to remove that. And uh, and so most people who have been at, who've been educated today don't know very much about that because it's not taught. I just happened to have um, a professor who was at uh, um, Harvard, and uh, at Harvard they still teach that. And he taught me at the College of William and Mary, so I was I was exposed to that information. Uh, which would not normally be politically correct, so they wouldn't be allowed to teach it. And uh, but uh, uh, it's uh, interesting to see the combination. In the in the work that I have done, um, the geometrical combinations of the monad, <clears throat> which is entirely electrodynamic <clears throat> in nature enables you to predict the complete set of all elementary particles, stable or unstable. And, uh, and each elementary particle has various decay modes, and you can predict those. Can the work you have done enable you to predict the properties of the elementary particles and the decay modes? Uh, decay, uh, decay modes. modes. Oh, now it's really loud. loud. Okay. Uh, decay modes, no. The energy values, yes. So you are only predicting a, a part 
of the set of information that we have on the various elementary particles. Correct. Hey, we have a uh, Carl Lippman. You have a question. Go ahead, Carl. Yes, uh, I did have uh, a question, uh, and it's uh, this: uh, uh, that uh, there, there are uh, seem to be in this world uh, uh, minimum energy in space, uh, such as uh, cosmic. Uh, background uh, radiation, uh, which is a, a very weak energy in space, I guess moving at the speed of light, and it, uh, uh, its energy is equivalent mm -hmm. to uh, one electron per cubic meter. And we also have a maximum uh, energy in space, uh, perhaps uh, represented by uh, a, a black hole, uh, uh, are a, a neutron star, and, and again, th that represents a a huge energy per unit volume. You know, as I said before, the the, the uh, cosmic uh, background radiation represents a very small uh, 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 energy per unit volume in space. So I guess my question is this. Uh, um it it looks like your wave uh, uh theory of things uh uh cannot get rid of at least cannot get rid of very long uh, in a in certain volumes in certain fairly stable volumes uh a minimum uh of uh energy will always be there and a, a maximum uh, energy uh, density will also be in certain regions of space. Uh, so uh, uh, is, I guess my, my question is, my first question is, is that, uh, do, do you model uh, that uh, in, in some ways a, a maximum energy uh, density and a minimum energy density uh, in a certain uh, volumes of space? There is no to either. I haven't tackled either a, a minimum or a maximum. Okay. Um, well, the, right now talking through it, I'm not even sure how to approach it. But no, I, I haven't is the answer. Okay. Uh, in your uh, equation, uh, your, your EWT equation, uh, E equals it looks like a density, a row. It, it, the, is, the, is that row uh, energy per volume? Uh, is that the uh, units associated with the row or density uh, uh, term in your uh, uh, EWT equation? Uh, yeah, it's, um, I just use SI units, so that row is kilograms per meters cubed. Kilogram, kilogram would seem to be a mass uh, rather than an energy. A kilogram times a velocity squared, you know, w would be an energy term. But okay, I, I'll I'll try to work that out. Uh, uh, you know, so that your equation comes out uh, as I'm sure it likely does. Uh, and you know that an energy is equal to a bunch of terms uh, that end up after you cancel out various uh, units. Uh, an energy is equal to an energy. Okay. Well. Okay. Yeah, you'll you'll see it. It resolves to to joules eventually. That equation uh, in SI units at least resolves to kilograms per meter squared over second squared. Um, yeah, but you'll see it resolves in in, in units correctly. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Cornelius, you had to raise your flag. Yes, uh, Jeff, basically you, you had a couple of different points you had. One of them was basically about the wave pattern itself making a particle, and the other was, was how the particles combine to make larger, uh, pat larger particles and larger uh, 
molecules in that. But on the second one, you really never put the two together, it seems like, where you put the wave patterns in to show like what is the wave pattern you would expect the neutrino to have. And an additional question is, uh, uh, you don't have a wave pattern showing where if you have two wave patterns, how those wave patterns uh, would, it, how and why those wave patterns uh, would attract each other uh, like gravitationally. And yeah. I, I think you've probably gone through that in some other demonstrations perhaps, but, uh, and maybe there's not time for here. Plus I don't think our screen's working to show it anyway. Yeah, so that one I actually do have an answer for. And yes, um, I have gone to the details of the wave patterns for each one of the particles. Um, I, I excluded it from the presentation to be, you know, be simple today, but I do have that and I can forward on additional information. Okay, so Jeff, why don't you go ahead and try and stop your screen sharing and then restart it? Because I think it's just a transient thing. We might be able to get that working. Um, in the meanwhile, we have uh, Lee, you have your flag raised. Uh, thank you. I just want to say um, I, I, I'm really impressed with Jeff, and I'm really impressed with everyone here. And um, I have a, I really like the the, the monads that uh, Jeff talked about, or not Jeff, but um, but uh, Bill, Bill talked about. Yeah, Bill. Um, my big question is, I, I uh, what what becomes what is before a neutrino? If we have the ether, which we can kind of agree on, but what in your mind, Jeff, makes a neutrino, or how is it is how is it birthed? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. The you know since I that David's um, David uh, De Hilster's uh, suggestion was since I launched my YouTube channel, probably the most questions are about what happened at the beginning. You know whether it's the Big Bang. I, I don't have an answer uh, for that. Uh, Everything that I've modeled is what takes place today. I should point out that everything that I've been comparing against are um, observations that we have, you know, today, basically from Earth. Uh, so I, I can't go back in time, and I really can't answer that question. I wish I knew the answer. Can I follow up with another question? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Um, so there's this thing called a, a bezel function, and that's kind of a, a, a wave propagating. Um, compounding wave that has um it, it looks a lot like the electron wave that you were showing in in the water kind of going up and down the standing wave um now a bezel function is really funny because uh if you take the electromagnetic spectrum from radio waves to microwaves to infrared to visible light to ultraviolet to x-ray and gamma as we know it EMF, as you go down that spectrum, it gets faster and faster, those uh, wave frequencies get tighter and tighter. But if you take each one of those quantized wave packets and you merge them into one single wave function, it's called the bezel function. And that wave function is the neutrino wave that you guys are talking about. It's that standing wave with the discrete heavy center going up and down mm -hmm. like a white hole and a black hole. And uh, I find that very fascinating because if you hit an electron with electromagnetic radiation, say like 660 nanometers, what's the electron do? It, it spits right back the same electromagnetic radiation it got hit with. So where did that electromagnetic radiation come from? Is it a reflection? Is it an absorption? Our textbooks say it, it's an absorption. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, I've never thought of it in terms of, uh, of the photons. I've been thinking about it in terms of the, the longitudinal waves that I, I mentioned, because I, I see the photon as a transverse wave. But I suppose either way, it'd still be the, the same thing if we were to, this goes back to this, I think some of the first questions around, all right, what is it reflecting off of? And we we're trying to imagine a standing wave. If we imagine the, you know, all the particles are mm -hmm. consist of wave centers, as Dr. Wolf called it, they, they reflect back that, that energy. Uh, so, so yes, yeah, so even though I've never really thought of it in terms of the bezel function or photons, I, I, I can imagine those wave centers reflecting uh, back the photons as well. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. So, Cornelius, you raised your flag. Well, let's just go back into the neutrino and it being a standing wave. It's not exactly how I see a neutrino, but the, the reason I uh, have a difficulty with the neutrino being a standing wave is I don't believe that uh, neutrinos always home, 
Oh, I've always been believed just uh, moving at the speed of light, and we've really never been able to capture or see one standing still like we can an electron or a neutron or a proton. Uh, and so I consider a, a, neutri a neutrino more of a uh, traveling wave and actually probably more of an interference pattern of waves that's, that's tr the pattern is traveling. But uh, so I would be interested, in, definitely interested in seeing your image of a uh, neutrino and why uh, you know what it would look like you know standing still uh. yeah I'll, I'll try to describe it without the visual maybe the neutrino is easier but if i were to you know, starting first with the data and again i'll go back to the, um, the linearization um, but if we go back to where does that line start with it's um starts at about 2.39 electron volts roughly the the energy of the neutrino um, but the way that all of it was was modeled in in terms of of volume, because um, remember that that k to the fifth, that that k was the um, the particle count. So neutrino had a k equals one value, which uh, means there's one wavelength. So there's only one standing wave wavelength, and and that defines the radius. But that's essentially the model. Then, if I were to picture each one of these particles, that's what it would be. So the neutrino would just be one wavelength and one standing wave, and that's the, and that's two uh, point three nine electron volts. So one wavelength would just have a specific diameter, and beyond that, there would be no additional waves. It would be traveling in form. The standing waves break down, not enough amplitude to keep to maintain the standing form. And so it breaks down immediately from one wave to no waves. Uh, exactly. Oh, yeah, or to traveling. It's. Uh, I, I, when I first showed the the wave, it was a static image in the presentation. It was the one from Gabriel Lafreniere. He has the yeah. simulation of the electron where it's standing waves, and then beyond that, they still they're still waves, but they're traveling waves. They're not standing. Yeah, then then we run into the problem. Of basically, a, a standing wave need needs a boundary. Uh, both the center boundary and the outside boundaries. I, I can't quite see where that outside boundary, what what that outside boundary is composed of. But okay. Uh, yeah, I think Jim Martson had a similar comment about that, in that he thinks that well, why isn't it we just have a solid particle, and that thing is the thing that's creating the waves? Like I said, uh, it's like the balloon, the pulsing balloon. And in that way, because the problem seems to be is conceiving how this standing wave could exist versus a solid pulsing particle, I think we could see how that works. But we can't see how there being no central particle, uh, how that thing itself can be a standing wave. So, Jeff, what do you think about the idea that there's just a pulsing balloon as a particle? And it is a particle. Because some people think of it that way. I don't know. It might, might be the same chicken and egg problem. But I, I do believe, well, actually, no, I, from everything that has been modeled, including the computer simulations from Lafreniere, uh, there is still an in wave. Now, whether or not you want to say that originates from a pulsing balloon or if it's reflected from the balloon, I think that's where we get into the chicken and the egg. No, I think that's not a chicken. That's too completely. This is this whole. Uh, dichotomy between people who think that matter is made out of just solid particle or people who think that matter is actually made out of waves. So that's two different camps. You know, personally, I don't believe that matter is in any way made out of waves. My conception is that an electron is like a marble. And if you were to get a microscope big enough to examine an electron, you'd find a marble-like object which has a hot solid surface you can't go past it. It has all the properties of a marble. It's just smaller versus uh, the type of uh, conceptions of what you're doing, which is to say that somehow that solid object we perceive as a marble is actually made out of waves. And my objection to that is that wave, all wave phenomena, they pass right through each other. There, there's no boundary that can be made. So if you had two electrons that are both made out of waves, one would predict they would just pass right through each other. In fact, all matter should pass right through each other if it was composed of waves. This is what waves do. So what do you think of that objection? 
quick correction because um, it's not exactly what I said. Uh, um, so there is still something referred to as a wave center. And again, I'm because I come from from the Dr. Milo Wolf camp. I'm reusing his term instead of making up something, but that is still something that is discrete. Um, you can call that your marble, but that wave center is what reflects waves. What I think what we're measuring as a particle, I think that's where it's um, maybe it's a little bit different from what you're explaining. What we measure as a particle is standing waves of energy. But if you were to look at the that core, uh, that's what I think is what you can think of as, as a marble. Wolf called it a wave center. Well, I would agree with this whole terminology of wave center. Definitely an electron, whatever the heck it is, it's uh, emitting some kind of wave, right? So I, I'm in total agreement about with, with your theories about there being some kind of wave and that there's opposite phasing of different uh, charges and that's what the origin of that. So I totally agree with all that. Um, the only difference just being this one point about <clears throat> exactly what the electron is made of. Now, me personally, I don't have any claim to what that's made out of. So, you know, it's possible that Wolf's model could still work with mine since I make no particular claim of a, you know, what an electron is. Jeff, do you, do you have any comment towards uh, Franklin's statement that waves just travel through each other uh, and don't and pass by each other. Uh, I have a problem with that, and I, I don't believe that's necessarily true. As a matter of fact, I'm sh I'm certain it's not. But do you have an opinion I, on that? I I, I, I absolutely do. Uh, waves are constructive, uh, constructive or destructive, depending on on their phase, and that's um, that's that's model. I didn't even cover that today, but I have a lot of thoughts on that on the website and modeled in in math. But yeah, the waves absolutely affect each other is the point. They're constructive and destructive. So, Harry, you have a leg up. Finally, we get back to me. Um, Jeff, I have an issue with uh, the equations that you write down and their definition of K. So I would appreciate it if we could go back to that part of your presentation. I'm not sure what K is. Yeah. So yeah was, could we go back that it works to that? Time, though. I'm going to try to screen share again. Last couple of times I tried this for some reason it didn't work. Uh, How about now? What do you see? Ripples on water. So no, but I stuck. can try and put up your presentation, Jeff. So maybe this is where let's, we use the back. Let's of do here. it that. Let's yeah. Let's do it that way because ripples on water. Yeah, I was, I was on that page long ago. I'm not sure what's what's going on. So it's Franklin, if you could do it. Apparently. Yeah, we, we, we loaded it. Franklin has a backup, and it's a good thing we did. So, Franklin, can you try to bring it up? I'm trying. I'm clicking on it. It's not doing anything. <laughs> it looks like it's we're trapped in the uh, technology not working correctly. This is sad. We had both a primary and a backup. Okay, and so as I understand your theory, okay, you know, um, develop, it's sort of hard to put some kind of logical structure on on this discussion because a lot of people are throwing in outside ideas but essentially as i understand what you're saying is you sort of created a wave model based on uh waves in the ether so there's an ether assumption in there and um then you derive this wave equation which I'm not really quite clear on how that's done. And then you get a parameter K, which I'm not real sure what K is. And then you find that based on K, you can create something that resembles a periodic table of the elements. So you organize the elementary particles in terms of the parameter K as if K is like atomic number. Uh, is that summarized basically what you've done? Yeah, my, my image is back, by the way. Yeah, now it seems to be working. Okay, here's one of my first questions I have. I noticed that in your wave equation, uh, Planck's constant doesn't appear, but you assume it in your photon energy equation. What happened to Planck's constant? Yeah, see down there where it says energy wave equation, Planck's constant's not in it. That's, um nor is mass, nor a lot of things. The URLs that you see at the very bottom show the derivations. I, I did not get into the details. That's a 
longer discussion, but I, sh I show the details of the der derivation, how to put everything in terms of the wave constants you see there. Uh, by the way, uh, Franklin's controlling this, so I can't bring up that web page. But all right, so now Franklin, if you where want to copy that K, URL, where does K come in? I, I don't see K anywhere on this slide. Oh, it's not on this slide. So Franklin, if you go to the next one, then I took that. I started with an. I think it's the next page, Franklin. Then I started with an assumption that, uh, that similar to hydrogen, one proton, that there had to be a fundamental particle, and then that the combination of those particles led to other ones. I gave that the letter K. Okay. And then the so next my page, question is, what is K and where, I guess, where what K is becomes kind of a crucial point here. Yeah. So that is, again, I tried to simplify this presentation. The details are all in a paper. In fact, part of it's also on the website. I'd be happy to send the, the URL. But, but I wanted to keep this presentation simple, so let me talk through it on this slide, if you will. If you take the uh, particle energy, no, no, frankly, go back to that one you were on, the, the graph. Well, yeah. I, I guess what I'm trying to understand is what is K is really what I want to know. K is a particle count. So if you were to put two particles together, let's just call them the neutrino, because that's eventually what this slide was was telling me, that everything goes back to a certain energy value as number one. But if you were to put two particles together, that's k equals two, and then it has a larger, see, it's, uh, read uh, point number two, it explains why it's k to the fifth. Two particles together reflects more waves, so therefore it reflects the amplitude, the wavelength, but it also extends, this is the conversation I think we were hung up on in terms of the, the volume, what is measured as the standing waves and, and where do they break down, what is that perimeter, but that volume, is what is described here in that k to the fifth. So for every every particle that you add, so every number of k's, essentially, it increases each of these, amplitude, wavelength, and its volume. And so it's to the fifth power. And once you take it to the fifth power, you recognize that all of the particles can be linearized. What are you taking to the fifth power? Is that mass or energy? No, 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 k, it's a particle number. So it's uh, put two neutrinos together, for example, or here, I'm gonna use Milo Wolf's um, speak. So why Milo Wolf's terminology is wave centers. Put two wave centers together and it's two, two to the fifth. So like on your chart here, when it shows 71, that's actually 71 to the fifth with some gigantic number. Correct. That's correct? But, but yeah, it's correct, but it, it's a, it is a gigantic number. If you look at the difference between the neutrino mass and the Higgs, it's, it's massive. But if you take it to the fifth power, you get a line that looks exactly like this. Okay, now getting back to your presentation here. Uh, so you were here when, when Lori Gardy was giving her presentation and she exactly showed these two uh, E equals MC squared and E equals HF. And uh, you know her comment was that you can't equate these things because the, the HF is a description of power while EMC squared is, is uh, energy, so you wouldn't be able to, and, and she seemed to be kind of uh, uh, dismissive of people who equate these things together. So what, what is your response to that? I don't remember that part of the conversation, but E equals HF is not power, that's energy, uh, power. Yeah. power yeah. Right yeah. E equals HF is the amount of energy emitted over a second that the basically, you can't equate these things because there's a time component in here that does not exist in uh, E equals MC squared. E equals MC squared is a fixed amount of energy for a single event versus E equals HF, which is number amount of individual uh, light quanta over a fixed amount of time. So that's C saying that you can't, you can't equate those two. C is a velocity and therefore has time as one of its components. It does, but when she did her, uh, her whole thing was about units analysis, showing that E equals HF actually has another it time component, which is not at all equivalent to what's in MC squared. But I'm surprised she didn't hear about that. She, she thinks that you can't equate these two together, and I would have to agree. Well, Franklin, I was actually, uh, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, I was on this there whole I... argument, is kind of a red herring in my opinion because essentially the way I see it is that Jeff can say these are empirical facts 
these two equations describe empirical facts, and as far as we know, they apply in all situations, and so therefore they're valid. And um, you know, that seems to me you've assumed that, correct? On the basis of the empirical demonstration of the validity of these two equations, right? I mean, what you derived from Wolf and the other guy. Uh, so bottom line is, um, you know, if this theory has a problem and you want to, you know, question these two equations, then, then that's where you could go because you could say, well, I don't believe those equations. So we kind of have to accept those two equations as being empirically demonstrated. Yes, but I think the point was that these are two completely different types of phenomenon. In E equals MC squared, we have the conversion of some mass into energy. Okay, so that's that's like an apple. And then with E equals HF is the amount of energy uh, in a photon. So there's no disintegrating mass here. That's like an orange. So can we equate apples to oranges in this case? Well, you know, that's just a, you know, that's just a nitpick, you know, that you can no, say that's the theory is wrong because you don't accept that premise. I mean, these are premises that the theory is built on, and you can say, I don't accept those premises. And that would be the point. I mean, that was, I think, uh, Lori's not here, so I'm just trying to argue what she might say. But the problem is, is if your energy wave equation is actually derived by equating these two seemingly completely different things, then I would think that the entire premise is suspect. Mm, no, I think the, the logic there is wrong. So first off, as a correction, the wave equation is not derived from this other way around. If you follow the URLs at the bottom, uh, those two equations are derived from the energy wave equation. The But the comment about apples and oranges, they appear to be apples and oranges right now, but they are linked. And, and not just mathematically, we could argue that you know, all day long. The, if you look at the observations, you can, annihilation of an electron and a positron creates photons. The energies are linked. Well, you threw me when you said the wave equation, these, the, I'm not really sure, you know, okay. So my initial impression in seeing this slide is, is that you're assuming E equals MC squared E equals HF, and then based on those empirically established equations, you derive the third equation at the bottom, and now you're saying that's not what you're doing? No, this, this, this here was just starting with something that was familiar. If you follow the, the logic below, I use the wave equation to derive the particle equation or to derive the photon energy equation, not, not the other way around. Okay, so what, how do you come up with the energy wave equation? That kind of becomes the main issue. Yeah, so I started actually with um, uh, sound waves and, and other types of waves. So, so I was just thinking, all right, how are particles and photons linked together? And because I was already following Wolf's work, um, I began with something that just models sound waves, right? And if you model... Uh, longitudinal waves today, sound waves, they have an amplitude, they have a wavelength, they have a, a speed. The speed is going to be different than C that you see here, but this is a very similar equation that's used for modeling waves today. All right, I guess I understand now what you did. Okay, I was confused before. Thank you for clarifying. All right. Okay, I'm going to try and share my screen that has <clears throat> Jeff's screen on it. Do you guys see that? Uh, Jim, you have a question? Can you guys see that screen? I actually was looking at screen and, and then you flipped out of it. I don't know if this is off topic, but uh, what is your position on uh, Einstein's relativity? If, if you're talking about an ether, I would imagine you would have to uh, object to that. Um, I... I I think that some of the equations, equations are probably right. I mean, it's hard to dispute the equations. I think the, I think the uh, interpretation of those equations. Those equations. Yeah. yeah. Franklin, can you mute? I hear a huge echo. Yeah, I, I don't know if I necessarily I agree with the interpretation. Like, for example, warping a space time. 
Yeah, Jim, you'll have to mute yourself when you're not speaking because you're the source of the echo. So you have to unmute yourself in order to speak and then mute yourself. Okay, so let's go on. So Cornelius, you've uh, raised your flag. Well, I was just going to comment on, on Jeff's last uh, flat slide where we had the E MC squared and E equals HF. And I, uh, Jeff, would that, wouldn't that be equating the uh, traveling wave energy to the standing wave energy? Yes. Another part not discussed today, I actually uh, have a breakdown of how um, how particles, you know, such as the, um, not only uh, um, annihilation, you know, such as the electron positron, but also capturing an electron into an atomic orbital uh, can be a transfer essentially of photon energy to, to matter energy. Um, I have that elsewhere on the site, and, and sorry I didn't cover that today, but I'd be happy to maybe do that as a future topic. Okay, so we have David De Hilster. Uh, hey, Jeff, you hear me? We hear you. Yes. Okay, uh, first of all, thanks so much for presenting. I've been uh, waiting a long time for you to really start presenting your stuff in detail to our group. You know, I think it's fantastic. Again, you know, even though I have a totally different model, there are things in it in your model that, um, you know, I don't necessarily agree with. Um, I still think it's a, a fantastic model. Um, I have a, a sort of a higher level question I'm a little curious about. Um, one of the things that a lot of dissidents will do is to use vocabulary in the system that's in place already. Just to give you a few examples, uh, quarks, neutrinos, um, some of us don't believe those are in existence, but a lot of times dissidents will work, and I know I, I don't want to name names, but um, they will work within uh, a system that uh, other lots of us don't agree that uh, they even exist. But it, it, one of the things that's uh, an intention sometimes of dissidents is to work within that system to try to, it's not to appease, but it's really try to, um, you know, use the terms, use the things to explain better. One of the things I, I, I really believe that, you know, a system like yours, which is, you know, right or wrong, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong, uh, is that it, it takes the current system and it makes it a lot better. I mean, that's for sure, in my opinion. Um, what, what was your intentions, uh, you know, quarks and neutrinos, those people who argue against that, obviously you're using that. What was at the top level? What were you thinking at that point? Is it something that you just believe those things to be true? Is it the system you're trying to work on, on top of? Um, and a follow-up question would be, let's say we, we do finally agree the neutrino doesn't exist. It was invented to save special relativity. But I, I don't see that changing, you know, making your model worse or better. Um, but I was curious as to your um, uh, 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 accepting of quarks and neutrinos and things like that. So on terminology, yes, if there's a word that has already been used, I don't try to reinvent something. Um, so hopefully that doesn't offend people. So yes, I, I use terms like neutrinos and quarks. Uh, I don't believe a quark is a quark. Um, elsewhere, I have some information on that. Again, that's one thing I, I've hit one slide and barely scratched the surface on a proton. Um, but I guess the, you started this question with you know, what I think about using uh, the same terms. I, I don't want to reinvent uh, terms and where there is data that exists, such as, you know, all these particles that are flying out of particle accelerators, I use those same names. Okay, that's a, that's a good answer. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're getting towards the end of the uh, conference here. Um, hey, I'm I have a question here, I just quick question. Well, I think we're kind of out of time because I've got another hard uh, conference I need to be at 9 a.m. So, unfortunately, I think we are out of time. But I would invite you to uh, contact uh, Jeff yourself. You know, I, I emailed a couple of questions along with some others, and he's very quite responsive. And uh, also, uh, his main website, which if you look at his main website, you'll see that we have just barely scratched the surface of uh, all the information that Jeff has. And he has uh, like a video for each uh, kind of thing that he's trying to explain. 
and uh, he looks like he's he goes like tries to explain a whole lot of different things so and uh, jeff if you want to come back and uh cover those other things i we would be great to have you pleasure but, yeah you know i do want to thank everyone for your time and for the questions i really appreciate it yeah, so like you go his website, his topics are energy, particles, photons, forces, atoms, content, constants. So I don't think there's really anything he doesn't cover. But uh, yeah. like some of your, the, the best uh, method of contacting Jeff? Email. Um, it's, uh, I'll, I'll just, um, maybe it's, Franklin can email, but uh, let me just say it real quick. Uh, probably email would be a good follow up. J E F F. S and Scott Y E E at gmail.com. But we can also do a follow up uh, and send that via email. Great. Yes, thanks. Well, the invitation does have his website, and website, I believe, has his contact information as well. Great. Well, it's a little bit buried in there, I would have to say. <laughs> it, it's almost like you don't want to put your name on your website here, but I think if you can hit contact, uh, there's a, there's a, yeah, you don't even have your email address in your website, so. Yeah. Which is That's a little. Spam. Yeah, just like spam emails, but um, yeah, no, feel free to contact me, it's fine. Okay, so thank you, Jeff, for your presentation, and thanks for everyone for providing uh, all of the very stimulating questions and discussion. But uh, that will do it for this week's episode. And uh, please join us again. Uh, this uh, conference happens uh, regularly every week, or as regular as we can make it. And uh, this will be put on a YouTube later on today, hopefully, uh, for you to review if you had any other further questions. Recording of the conference has stopped.